You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is November 4, 2016, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, a patient with hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis. Our presenter is Dr. Brooke Polk. She's an Allergy Immunology Fellow in the Division of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Do you know like what his his CMV was that like urine or blood? This was blood. Oh, PCR. Mm-hmm. PCR. Mm-hmm. And the HHV6 was a blood PCR. Mm-hmm. He's had more since then. Um, the liver team was consulted. They attributed <sighs> the acute liver injury probably to shock and poor perfusion. Um, they did do an abdominal ultrasound which showed a normal liver and spleen, including like echogenicity and texture and size. So they looked okay. Renal continued his CRRT and helped manage his electrolytes. Um, and we were consulted. We initially just recommended, you know, a basic immune workup as this was looking to be more of a metabolic issue. Um, and by the time to half, like I said, there was increased concern rates for HLH. So in order to learn a little bit more about that, I wanted to talk about it because um, even though it sounds pretty rare and obscure, it's actually somewhat relevant to our field and we have to know a little bit about it for our board. So HLH is a severe and life-threatening syndrome of immune dysregulation with multi-organ failure requiring emergent diagnosis and prompt management. It's generally considered a disorder of T-cell function um, because it it affects your CTLs, which are your T-killer CD8 positive T-cells, and your NK cells. Most often it's actually seen in very small children from birth through 18 months, usually under the age of three months. Um, it can be familial or it can be secondary, and it can also be the first presentation of a primary amino deficiency syndrome. So how it is named, um, the different parts, so we'll start with the lymphohistiocytosis part. What that means is you have impaired function of your T cells, your T killers, and your NK cells, so that leads to excessive macrophage activation, and macrophages are a type of histiocyte, so that's how it got that name. And they're usually digested by your CTL and your NK through the perforin system. And I've got a picture in a little bit to kind of explain that. And so what happens is between the macrophage and then your CTL or your NK, you get an immunological synapse, and that makes a little snare complex. It, you make a pore, and then your cytolytic granules get delivered, such as your granzyme, and then that leads to apoptosis of that cell. Um, and your laboratory correlation of that is you see impaired NK function. And then the hemophagocytic part is your macrophages through their heme scavenger receptor, which is CD163. Um, phagocytose pretty much everything that they come into contact with. They're not very selective. So they eat the red blood cells, they eat the platelets, they eat white blood cells. In your laboratory correlation on that is cytopenias, and you can actually measure the CD163 in soluble form, so that is elevated as well. And you can actually see this on biopsy one of the things you look for to diagnose it, but it's not pathognomonic. It can actually be seen in other disorders as well. And then you get this cytokine storm because you have this overactivation of your macrophages and your T cells and your NK cells, and so you get multi-organ failure. You get interferons and TNF and all kinds of interleukins just kind of go crazy. Um, what we can measure in that process is CD25 which is important for boards. Um, it's the soluble alpha chain of the IL-2 receptor, and um, you kind of get end organ damage from all of those things. So, so the CD25, it's not just specific to uh, HLH, right? It, it's nope. inflammatory. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it indicates T cell activation pretty much. Okay. Yeah, it's not, it's one of the diagnostic criteria for HLH, but it is not pathognomonic for it. This is a really cool picture. I think it's from up to date. So this is a histiocyte or macrophage, and inside of it is a nucleated red blood cell. This is in the bone marrow and some platelets. So it has eaten them, and this is what you look like. So these kids are really sick. Um, they have, it's described as a febrile illness. So interestingly, our child has not spiked a fever whatsoever during the entire course of his admission so far, but it's febrile illness with multi-organ involvement, and it's often quite abrupt. Um, 
you see fever, your liver gets big, there's bleeding because your liver is dysfunctional, you get splenomegaly, big lymph nodes. Neurologic symptoms typically portend a poor prognosis. Um, you can get respiratory distress and failure, cardiovascular collapse, renal dysfunction. There's different types of rashes that can pretty much look like whatever. Laboratory findings, cytopenias, especially anemia and thrombocytopenia, because they all get eaten. Um, elevated ferritin, so a level above 2,000, has a 70% sensitivity and 68% specificity for HLH, which is decent. Um, hepatitis in nearly all patients, and they have elevated LDH and triglycerides, um, which you might see late. Um, you get dysregulated coagulation. And then the CD25, just a little bit more about it, um, it's expressed on activated B and T cells. It suppresses self-reactive T cells and prevents CTL cytolysis and suppresses NK cells. So the fact that it's elevated in soluble form might mean that your T cells are just spitting it out even though they can't work. They don't, it's not completely clear. Is it elevated ferritin? Is that just a phase reaction? Is that why? It yeah, <laughs> I think so. So macrophages are actually a the primary source of ferritin. I didn't realize that. So I think it's just because there's so many of them and they're so active, it just gets spit out. So HLH is typically classified into primary and secondary forms. So primary form is usually attributed to the familial form. So they've identified genes in five different parts of the perforin pathway. They're autosomal recessive. Um, it's found quite often in Asia, more so than the United States and Europe, um, and it's up to 25% of HLH cases are actually familial. So some of the genes of note, I don't know if this is important or not for boards, um, they're not in our study guide, but maybe, um, are here. So that it can be pretty much any part of the pathway. So the perforin, it can be when the granules mature, or get exocytosed, or get released, pretty much, pretty much any part. Um, there's secondary HLH, which is acquired might be due to illness, malignancy, or PID. Um, malignancy is more common in adults. And then there's a special form of HLH that some people call HLH, some people call separate, but it's a macrophage activation syndrome, uh, which is associated with systemic onset JIA and other rheumatologic disorders. This is your perforin pathway. Um, so the indicators <coughs> of note, I don't know why some are black and some are green, but anyway, here's perforin, which is PRF1, here's your little snare complex. So what happens basically is your little cytolytic granules get moved to the surface of the cell, they get exocytosed, your perforin comes, it perforates um, the, the target cell, and then it releases your little cytolytic granules enzyme, and that leads to calf bases and apoptosis of that cell. So these are the pictures of the different genes that might be affected. In terms of primary immunodeficiency, there are quite a few that we need to know that might be associated with HLH. Um, so neutrophil disorders are one subset of that process. Um, CGD very rarely can be associated with HLH. And then you also have your three somewhat similar but slightly different disorders. So Griskelli syndrome, um, all of these next three involve some form of oculocutaneous albinism or hypopigmentation or something that on physical exam would be pretty identifiable. Um, Griskelli syndrome also has thrombocytopenia and immune deficiency and neurologic defects, and that is a mutation in the RAB27A, which is earlier in the pathway right here in this picture. And you have your Chediak Higashi, which I think we're all familiar with. That's the problem with your LYST or CH1 gene. Um, it's physical recessive. You also get neutropenia and sinopulmonary infection. And then later on in the disorder, they get neuropathy and ABV lymphoproliferation. And then buzzword for boards is impaired phagolysosome formation. And then on a peripheral smear, it's got a lot of good things. Um, you see giant granules. And then hernansky pudlak syndrome, from my understanding, is more rare. It's a problem with platelet storage, and they also have lung issues. So here's an interesting, cool picture for Chediak-Higashi syndrome. So you've got these giant primary granules, which are these big old blobs, and then your few secondary granules. So basically, if you see a peripheral smear with a cell with a bunch of that, and it's probably going to have Chediak-Higashi. And then another thing that you might see on boards or just 
in general the hair sample and so because because they have partial oculocutaneous albinism they have you know differences in the melanin distribution in their hair follicles so this one over here is normal so you have a fine homogeneous distribution everything looks nice and pretty Shetty at Kagashi, you get this evenly distributed small clumps. And so rather than being a uniform, they kind of have little dots. And then the Griskelli syndrome has little um, unevenly arranged larger clumps in the middle for the medulla of the hair. And K deficiencies, I've got to tell you, I don't know a lot about them, but there is a chart in our study guide, and that can be associated with HLH as well. You can get your classical NK deficiencies which is GATA2 mutations typically. You'll see a lot of viral infections in those patients, and you can diagnose it by decreased NK function and CD16 much well. And then your functional deficiency, you'll have a normal CD16, you do have a normal number of NK cells, but they just don't function properly, so they'll also have low function. And then there's a whole other subset of disorders um, that are associated particularly with EBP, HLH. And so the most important one to know is X-linked lymphoproliferative disease, um, in which, for whatever reason, boys just can't respond to EBV. So they get a fulminant disease and then can die very quickly. Um, it's a mutation in the SH2B1A gene, which encodes SAP, which is SLAM-associated protein. And so as we remember from immunology lectures, and we'll get to soon, um, for the first year, this is a problem in the TCR signaling pathway involved in MK and T cell activation. And so there's a whole bunch of proteins like um, SLAM and LIC and SARC and all those things in the, in the TCR pathway that all kind of come together. So this is just one of those. There's another form, it's less common, XIAP, which is involved in apoptosis. And so these, these boys have this gamma globulinemia. They have a combined immunodeficiency with low CD4 and high CD8 cells and low NK cells, and they're, they can be quite anemic as well. X-Men, I think it's a, it's a cool abbreviation. So it's X-linked PID with a magnesium defect and EBV neoplasia. And then I'm not sure how important those other two are, but you can look at them if you like. And then here is a, a big table of everything that, that you could think of um, from a recent article put out this year about gene mutations associated with HLH. And so they kind of lump all this into primary because they all have a genetic mutation of some kind. So here's the familial one. And then X-linked lymphoproliferative disorder, the neutrophil disorders we talked about, ADA and PHP deficiency, so various forms of skin, IL-2 receptor alpha common gamma chain, Less commonly in Wiscott, Aldrich, and George, and then you have some other less common things down there. This can also happen in healthy kids just from getting a really bad viral infection. Um, and so some of the illnesses listed here can be associated with HLH. Um, interestingly, in neonatal HLH, which is kind of defined as the first four weeks of life, they often have disease associated with HSV and enteroviruses. And so the recommendation for this age group is to promptly receive a cycle of your therapy while they're being worked up. And malignancy, more common in adults, but can be seen in kids. Generally, malignancies that affect your T cells or your NK cells, but it can be B cell leukemias and, and solid tumors as well. And then this can be seen in immunosuppression or reconstitution, such as after a transplant of some kind or um, on initiation of heart for HIV. So the suggested evaluation is, is fairly thorough. Um, some of the lists we already spoke about. And then for micro, they recommend cultures of affected body fluids, viral PCRs um, of or other suspected viruses in evaluation of the CSF, especially if they have neurologic symptoms. Bone marrow evaluation is definitely recommended, and it can, from a cellularity standpoint, it can pretty much look hypo, hyper, normocellular. Hemophagocytosis, although you'd expect to see it all the time, is only seen 25 to 100 percent. So depending on what study you look at, it can be seen every time, but not always. And the caveat is that sometimes it might show up a little bit later once other labs are starting to look a little bit better for whatever reason. Maybe. Um, <laughs> I'll just maybe read the other labs. <laughs> I, I don't know. 
So what you look for as well um, is that your activated macrophages are going to be CD163 positive, so you can stain for that. They're not cellularly atypic, um, so if you're looking at something like histiocytosis X, now called Langerhans cell histiocytosis, those are CD1A positive, and they look a little bit different. They're not normal looking there. I don't know. Something else. Um, imaging, chest x-ray, echo, and a thorough CT to evaluate for solid tumors, as well as an MRI of the brain. Oh, and then if you do suspect HLH based on your initial labs or the patient's presentation, you should obtain the soluble IL-2 receptor alpha, which is soluble CD25. You should look at your NK function. You should look at flow for expression of a couple of those enzymes we mentioned, such as perforin and granzyme B, as well as self-surface expression of the two genes that are involved in X-linked lymphoproliferative syndrome. Those two uh, complicated flow cytometry tests we don't do at our center here. Those are both 10,000. Um, you can also look at CD163, which is the mass activated macrophage marker in the soluble form, although I don't believe we do that here either. Immunoglobulin levels are typically recommended, although they can be very difficult to interpret in the very young. And then in lymphocyte subsets by flow as well. So this um, from our board review book, actually, is flow cytometry looking for perforin and granzyme B in normal cells and in HLH. So normally your NK cells are up here and they express a lot of granzyme and your CTLs also express some granzyme as well. And then perforin is on the x-axis over here. So you should see usually high levels of both. If it's normal, so it will be up here in the upper right quadrant. Um, but if you have HLH, it's abnormal, so you just don't get anything in those boxes. <coughs> There is a set of diagnostic criteria in which you need at least five of eight things to technically be diagnosed with HLH, and the authors of most of the papers that talk about this acknowledge that this was only for study purposes, so some patients who do have HLH may not necessarily need to meet five before treatment is initiated if there's high suspicion, but these are your five criteria. So fever, seen in most patients, blood amygdala, Cytopenia affecting two cell lines, so a hemoglobin less than 8, platelets under 100, or an ANC less than 1,000. High triglycerides or hypofibrinogenemia. And then hemophagocytosis on biopsy, typically of a lymphoid organ or the liver. Um, low NK activity, hyperferritinemia, and a high soluble IL-2 receptor. So I just put little stars by what our patients had. They have three of those things so far. If there's incomplete criteria, but you have a really high suspicion, experts in the field, like I said, would make the diagnosis if there were three or four clinical findings listed here and then one or four immune markers listed there, and our patient actually does not meet that criteria. Um, Texas Children did a retrospective study that showed a ferritin greater than 10,000 was 90% sensitive and 96% for HLH in kids. So that's pretty decent. What this kid have? 10,000, over 10,000. 10, yeah, it was above 10,000, it was above, yep. That's just EBV. Hmm? Did you say it was EBV? No, he actually hasn't been tested for that. So there is a, something called an H score, which is developed for adults with 10 variables, and the score ranges from less than 90 to greater than 250. So we can look at it real quick. I don't know if this link will work. Um, it's from... Europe, so the, um, oh gosh, what do you call it? The measurement reference units are a little bit different. Um, but I did go ahead and I converted and put our patient's stuff into here, and his probability was only 10%, but again, this is an adult. So genetic testing, and definitely in those who meet HLH criteria, is recommended. Um, typically, it's done by next-gen sequencing. There's an HLH panel, because although you would expect that you, they're autosomal recessive. So typically, you need two mutations, but it is possible to have biallelic variations, meaning you have one from each parent that are different, um, or hypomorphic mutations are possible as well. Differential is pretty broad. There's a lot of things that can make kids look really sick. Um, sepsis for sure is one of those. They're also going to have fever and cytopenia, liver involvement, and DIC. 
although they're not going to have evidence of ongoing lymphocyte activation once they start treatment. And the ferritin typically is not as high, and one difference is in HLH, your ferritin will rise as you get worse, versus in sepsis, it'll typically be stable or go down. With liver failure, um, some of the things can be seen, including encephalopathy and bleeding, but it's typically not a multi-system disorder. There's something called multi-organ multi-system organ dysfunction syndrome, which basically is a very sick person and the organs begin to shut down. Um, and with that, you won't really see as high of a ferritin level there. Um, Cytophagia kistiocytic paniculitis, if anyone's ever heard of that. I have not. Um, they have these subcutaneous nodules and they're less likely to be severe. And then HUSTTP on the differential, um, just because of the cytopenia findings, um, but they don't typically have liver involvement. So up to date does have um, a little algorithm for treatment indications, and so if you do suspect it, a hematologist should see this patient. If they're clinically stable, you should search for triggering conditions such as infections or rheumatologic disease. If they're acutely ill or deteriorating, you should go directly to HLA-specific chemotherapy um, plus intrathecal if they have any type of CNS disease, and then kind of go from there. So if you do decide, and we'll talk about what that treatment is, but if you do decide you want to go ahead and you can treat them, the recommendation is for HLA typing just to prep for a bone marrow um, transplant because that really is the only cure. Um, you should get cardiac function and look at your as well. Treatment, there really isn't a particular parameter to drive the decision to start therapy. Um, but there is a caveat that, you know, if they're unstable, you should deliver it promptly. So there's a couple different protocols. Um, the main one that they go by still is the HLH-4 protocol. So they get started on dex and etoposide for eight weeks. Um, if they do have CNS disease, they get intrathecal methotrexate and hydrocortisone. And if they improve, you should wean those. But if they don't improve, and there's really no time frame for non-improvement, I don't think you wait the full eight weeks. Um, but if they don't improve, you should continue therapy as a bridge to a transplant. And just of note, a transplant is required if they have CNS disease, if they have familial HLH, or if they have relapse, they just they get a transplant. There's an updated protocol in 2004. They're still waiting for the results of some of the studies based on that protocol, but it does involve early addition of cyclosporine, and I think a lot of centers are, are adopting that, although up to date still, the authors who wrote it still go, go by the older one. Um, and then obviously treat the trigger if there is one that you can find. For viral infections, um, typically they will say this could be EBV related if you have greater than 10,000 copies for a microgram. Um, and for that, the up-to-date authors actually recommend rituximab, although other centers will use IVH. And then that might actually be able to save them from needing chemotherapy. Um, supportive care. It's very important to use leukoreduced TMZ negative products to keep your platelets above 50, um, and they get other transfusions if they need them with cryo for bleeding problems and RBCs for anemia. If they do start on treatment, they need PJP prophylaxis and um, management of their blood pressure. There's a lot of things you can monitor to see if they're responding to treatment, obviously physical exam, or if they have a rash, is it improving, are they afebrile, have their lymph nodes and liver gone down in size, we recommend daily um, labs, as you can see there, with weekly cytokine levels, and they weren't very specific about that. I think they just meant the soluble IL-2 receptor. And then after eight weeks of induction, if they're not all normal, all of those things, then they get a transplant. And by three months, you know, some other labs may be lingering, you know, a little bit different, so maybe your LFPs aren't completely back down to normal, but by three months, everything should be approved. Um, Signs of relapse, you can probably guess things <coughs> So follow-up, um, should, they should be seen by a hematologist monthly for a year uh, with labs. And if they did have CNS disease, they should have evaluation of that one during the first. And an MRI brain, everything should be normal um, at six months. If they have refractory disease, you can retreat with the same regimen. Or there is a pretty new humanized monoclonal antibody to CD52 called alabutinib. Um, it is on mature teen and K cells that leads to antibody-dependent lysis. It's actually licensed in B-cell um, chronic 
leukemia and relapsing MS, but it's used off-label in this, and it has shown some success. Prognosis um, is pretty poor overall. For the familial patients, if they don't have therapy, they, they die within two months. They're universal. They don't make it. The cause of death um, in all cases can be toxicity from a transplant, failure of a graft, relapse, or infection. The protocol, the initial protocol back in 1994 that came out did increase your five-year survival to 54% plus or minus six. There were 249 patients in the study and the median age was nine months. A third of the patients almost died prior to a transplant, but if a transplant was done, five-year survival was 66 plus or minus 8%. Um, a little bit worse in the familial type, um, 50 plus or minus 13%, and like I said, zero survived without a transplant. If there's neuro symptoms, your prognosis is a little bit worse, about 40% five-year survival. Um, and studies have shown with the highest serum ferritin level and with a slow decline in ferritin level, your odds ratio of death was 17.4, so quite elevated. So back to our patient. It's still a little bit unclear what his diagnosis might be. He's day five of hospitalization. He's shown slow clinical improvements. He was actually able to be weaned off CRRT yesterday. It's continuous renal replacement therapy. Dialysis. Basically dialysis. Mainly. Like, okay. Yeah, they don't call it that. <laughs> I don't know. His ferritin actually dropped quite quickly from 10,000 to 773. His fibrinogen stabilized. His BNP improved quite a bit. His coagulopathy is just about all the way better. His transaminitis has improved. And this is all just with supportive care and antimicrobial therapy. Are they treating this I don't believe so. Bone marrow biopsy, he did not have hemophagocytosis on his bone marrow biopsy, but it showed marked erythroblastopenia. They could barely find any red blood cells whatsoever. And with the hemoglobin of 1.4, I, I don't know how many you expect to find. Um, but that did show that it was a production problem rather than a consumptive problem. Um, many labs are still pending. Hematology is considering workup for a congenital anemia, such as diamond black fan anemia, and then ID raised concerns for possible fulminant CMV disease. They did call the blood bank, um, and our typical blood products are leukoreduced and radiated, but that does not mean that they're CMV negative unless you actually test for them. So their question was, could he be CMV positive because he had received a blood transfusion? Very, very unlikely, probably not, but that did prompt the need to test other other body fluids for CMV and HHV6 just to see if those might be positive as well. His marrow has had his mom too. I'm not sure. His uh, marrow did have 2.2 million copies of HHV6, um, so that was definitely in there. Low level of CMV, I think it was about 1,000 or 2,000 copies, but it was in his marrow as well. Interestingly, over the course of the stay, white blood cell count, count, it was present. Yeah, sorry. Yes. The PCR was positive, but it was not an overwhelming number of copies mm. to infectious disease, anyway. I just thought this was interesting. Um, over the course of hospital stay, white blood cell count, nutrient cell count, lymphocyte count has slowly tended down, EOS has slowly tended up, if that means anything of importance to anyone. So. Here is back to immune evaluation of our, our patient. As you can see, a somewhat moderate T cell and NK cell lymphopenia, although this was drawn, you know, hospital day one when he was acutely ill. We did send off Trex. What was his white cell count in care? Normal. Uh, it was normal. This is the this is after that. So it's like second or third CBC when things had started to fall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so his absolute lymphocyte count at that point in time was slightly low. Um, his, let's see, it was, I think it might have actually been that one when it was pretty low. So we did send off Trek just to, you know, screen first get in. His, he had 20,311 Trek copies, so that's pretty good. Um, this was drawn, I believe, the day following this, and his numbers, although a little bit higher, still don't meet the reference range, which I put down here. At his age, we expect a CD3 count of 2,000, 1,500, and then 650, so he's still below. 
NK function is pending, mitogen antigen stem are pending, flow cytometry, those complex ones that I spoke about for the cell surface markers are pending. That's all I got. Um, there's any there wasn't like any consanguinity in the family. Nope. No, genetics did and now mom has like prenatal care but doesn't know about C and V. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know why they didn't check EBV? No, I don't actually. I did a, a like when I did my bone marrow transplant rotation, I had to do a presentation on EBV and involved proliferative disorders and primary immunodeficiencies and um and it was mostly about EBV, but uh, or li did his liver get better, or did it just mm -hmm. like yep. Yeah, everything got better. Interesting that his herds and crops are dramatically They pretty much just his supportive care. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would guess his liver was in such shock that it kicked out everything it could. Yeah. And right. And you reap the keys as well. Yeah. Once, okay. yeah, once we stop. Screen sharing and reporting, I can open the chart. And okay, so I take a look at it. I have a few questions in general oh, yeah. comments. Yeah. So one was early in the course, we had a hemoglobin one point or whatever. Uh -huh. Um, yeah, we did mitogen studies and things like that. It takes a, some volume of blood. Mm -hmm. Usually, they fight back if they're like hemoglobin <laughs> thick and they thick, and yeah. then we can't get all that volume. We well, didn't consult you on that day. He already got transfused. Came in with one point four with transfused. Okay. He responded remarkably well to transfusion. His hemoglobin went up to six. And okay. I just uh, you used to get 20 uh, mLs when we did national two yeah. um, I think they had found a way to get 10 mLs or something like that, but it was significant in the little pint size get up. Um, the other one is with the last, um, are you planning on repeating flow more clinically well? Absolutely. It's only because yeah. it kind of just like you know, the liver shock, you perfuse it, and it, all the numbers get better. Sometimes when you, the kid gets better clinically, you'll see mm -hmm. that the system may normalize a little bit, too. Um, two more comments that we've done. No, so please. you said primary HLH is 25%. So that means 75% mm -hmm. is secondary. Of secondary yeah. infection, immune deficiency, malignancy, you know, a percentage breakdown. I'm going to guess infection is the high one, but I don't yeah. think it's really. Uh, I would think that the 2575 is across the board, right? Because I don't know that the point of the standards. You think that the percentage of primaries is higher. That's true. It is across the board, although the majority of HLH is under age three months. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I would bet infections on the high end. Mm -hmm. uh, and he clearly has an infection component. It's just a question of whether or not something predisposed him to that or, or not. Yeah. And then lastly, the, the diagnosis is difficult with lots of different parameters that need to be met. A lot of them are unusual testing that won't come back super quick and all that. Mm -hmm. um, and then therapy, if they're sick, therapy is quite drastic because you want chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. So that would be an extremely hard call. If I was, I'd hate to be the hematologist trying to go, I yeah. don't know. And it, it's reflective and, you know, having spoken with them and reading the notes, they say, you know, we really just don't want to commit to this. It's a really big deal. And right. it's improving without that right now. So you would expect that it's probably not HLH, although I'm not sure what else would make your ferritin that high. I just don't know. Ferritin is, but not that high. You think? Side. You could argue because okay. his ammonia was 288 on presentation. Mm -hmm. I was thinking it was kind of all of And then immediately, so and they didn't do. I think that he had such hepatic dysfunction that all his markers were just were so unfair. Yeah. Can ammonia self correct that quickly, though? Like, it's yeah, well, not on CRT, too. Yeah. It was just. It's true. It's true. That's true. Yeah. But, That's but when I see you, they said, well, we don't think. Well, yeah. And like, well, we've seen that. Yeah, I don't know. I, I have. And, and when what? I read the genetics note, which was just a very brief note, mm -hmm. they didn't seem to be mm -hmm. favoring a diagnosis at that point. I don't know if they were They did an acyl carnitine profile and serum amino and urinorganic acids and a couple other things, and they all showed, they were all drawn early, so they all showed lactic acidosis. Right. But beyond that, it was just kind of repeat one well. Right. Yeah. So. Well, he, he had such a multi-system organ failure. 
Yeah. Like, we know the kidneys, we know the heart, this is all. Mm-hmm. And it was profound, too. Like, you know, so 6.6 6 pH. Yeah. I've always been taught that 6.6 6 is sort of incompatible with blood. Yeah, yeah I, my, my first yeah. thought when I saw that one point, is that right? And if it is, you didn't hear anymore, but... It was, it was, we had a really similar case, actually, without the serotonin being so high, but it seemed like a metabolic disorder. It was a kid that was probably, I think he was eight weeks old, and hemoglobin was 2.3, came in basically dead. Um, but ammonia, I don't think it was quite as high. It was like 150s, and actually that didn't, acidosis was severe and didn't recover. Um, just had severe coagulopathy, no factors, but... It seems so unusual, like if this was HLH, for it to improve with just supportive care without any therapy, that doesn't seem right. Like I agree. The cases of HLH that I've seen, it, like they, you go to chemo because they're not getting any better at all. Like they're just getting worse. I don't know. But, but like having, if it was a viral cause. Wait, I don't know. Oh, here. Leave us online. The other thing we haven't really talked about is, you know, live, but we don't know if so, Brooke, what do you think this patient actually has? What's their underlying disease? What do you think? I don't know. Do you? Do you think we're ever going to find out? Mm-hmm. The longer he's alive, the more likely. Yeah. Potentially, I mean, if he does continue to improve, there's a possibility. I mean, he's still intubated. They're weeding his ventilator support. He's off dialysis. I mean, he's showing slow signs of improvement, but is he still like on pressors or? Is he... Well, the thing is, if he continues to improve, at some point he'll be okay and he'll go home. The problem is, he might have it another episode if he has some of these um, mutations that you talked about. So it would be important to figure out what he's actually got, just so we know what to do in the future. Mm-hmm. Did he have splenomegaly too? Nope. No. Liver and normal and size. Hmm. <laughs> Have you send out an HLH gene panel? Are you going to do the uh, the new sequencing? So, hematology had spoken about you know waiting to genetically sequence him until he actually met criteria for HLH, and so I don't believe they're they're doing that. Um, would there be any you know PID sequencing or recommendations you would do? Like he came in with a normal lymphocyte count. It was nine thousand. So I think the chance of having skid is pretty low, but with, with normal be. tracks. So yeah. look for those obscure, like if his NK function comes back low, then do you go dig in for NK deficiencies? The thing is, this is the ideal patient for the next-gen sequencing because yeah. he's got a disease. We're not going to figure out what he's got. He kind of, It's too complicated. Um, if he recover, if he dies and that's it, it would still be nice to know because the parents might have more kids and those kids might have the same disease. And um, there are long periods when the kid's fine and then he suddenly decompensates and has this life-threatening, you know, potentially fatal condition. It would be good to know what he's got. So I would be inclined to, to recommend it. For some reason, we're still reluctant to do next-gen sequencing even though we have the machine and can do it. And I don't understand that. Part of it's a cost and insurance-related issue, too, though, because mm-hmm. it may not be covered. Did it really cost that yeah. much? Um, and that was proven to Nate Miller. It's like twelve, fifteen hundred dollars $1,500 to do the entire exome. Yeah, I'm, I'm less than a day in the hospital. Yeah, I'm going to charge. Right? Right. 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 not a protein yeah. count, yeah. And, yeah. and samples cost a lot more than just sequencing and figuring out what you've got. I was yeah, thinking that. The weird twist is they can run There's all those so tests many that are covered and have about a thousand and nobody bats an eye at it. The problem comes down to when it's not covered, who's paying for it. Um, yeah, and it, it, that doesn't make sense, but that's kind of the way it is. Mm-hmm. But I agree with you, Jay. I, I would think the next gen, and, and you know, just mainly to have more body of information, too, on how helpful the next gen is and how helpful for the family down the road. Helpful for us to learn that's a great way to look at it. Well, that, that would be my recommendation. I have no other recommendations. Would you do immunoglobulins in this baby? I'm sure they've already been done. And besides with all of the infusions and the, and the renal things and so on, they're going to be abnormal. You're not going to know what to do with the results. 
Yeah. And are you sure the Trex yeah. didn't come out of the transfusion also? You can't um, really... He a bad blood cell transfusion, but he had not received... Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Nope. When somebody's critically ill, you can't do an immune evaluation effectively. You have to wait till he's recovered and well and then do it because the mm -hmm. illness can mask it, can mask it. Yeah. When you order something like next gen sequencing, do you specify what you're looking for? You can. Yeah. I would talk to Sarah Soden or Neil Miller and just tell them what's going on and ask them for what they recommend that sequencing consist of. Okay. The, only, the only reason everybody is holding off is my guess is because it's not something they're, they're used to doing and everybody wants to wait and see what the other person does. It's, it's it's just sort of like the beta agonist thing that we were talking about before with the dynamic dosing. Nobody wants to do the new stuff, even though it's. Well, I think it's also people want to do a stepwise. Let's do this first, and if that's negative, we'll do that rather than. That, that's going to change. I think the stepwise is a foolish way of doing it. It's what we did when we didn't have a good way to get right to the source of the problem. Um, in the future, we're not going to do it stepwise. We're just going to do the test that tells us the answer. In the majority of the lab that we do on a patient that comes in like this, trying to find the current problems and not the diagnosis. Right. They mm -hmm. infer diagnosis based mm -hmm. on collection of information. Oh, well, this kid, this kid basically right. has House syndrome. What was that? He's got, he's got Dr. House syndrome. He's going to get sick, and he's not going to get well until Dr. House comes in and orders the right test and then they'll have an answer and, and treat him and he'll get better. This kid has that syndrome. You need Dr. House to come in. I think that ultimately, I mean, he's getting better, but we don't have an answer. Something like this could recur. So I think ultimately they're going to have to do. And his siblings will get it and then they'll blame us for not figuring out what he's really got. You have to find out what he's got. And we now have the, a way of doing that. Yeah. I think it's almost negligent not to do it, but that's just my opinion. So, Jay, with the next gen, it, are there different like levels of next gen that you order, or is it just one test and it does it all? Um, you can do an entire exome for about fifteen hundred dollars. All of the right. all they of do the whole all thing, but then they go searching for a particular thing. Right. So, I guess my yeah. question is, Dr. Portnoy, with the next gen. Does that give us an answer, or does that just simply say, well, this is not normal here, and this is not normal there, and this is not normal Right. There, it but, might not give an answer, right. but so, you have that information, and you have it for the future also. Yeah, and if it identifies a gene mutation that shows you're predisposed to, like, you know, some other... Well, it may just simply say, well, we've identified 30 different oh, mutations. Right. Right. Um, yeah, you're, you're, you're still thinking in the past. No. You're, still think, you're still thinking in the past. Um, you've got to think uh, in the future in the way that, and actually in the present now. But the next gen, you tell them what you're concerned about, and they'll look at those genes for known mutations. Right now, they're.